Good afternoon and thank you for tuning in to today's sermon. Do you enjoy a twist? Oh, you're, you're reading a novel or you're watching a movie and the plot seems to be heading in a certain direction uh, towards a particular ending and then there's a twist and you didn't see it coming. Uh, the good guy is actually the bad guy or what was uh, looking to be a happy ending turns out to be a sad ending, a tragedy. Uh, personally, I'm a big fan of the twist, as long as it's believable. Uh, I like being surprised. Over the last couple of Sundays, we have been looking at the reign of King Manasseh in Judah. And there is a twist, an unexpected change in the storyline. The account of his reign doesn't end where you assume it would. And this is what we're going to consider in our sermon today. Uh, thus far, we have thought about the mysteries of Manasseh's reign. Uh, namely, why was he so wicked? And why did the worst king have the longest reign? Uh, last week, we surveyed the wreckage of Manasseh's reign, the, the consequences of so thoroughly embracing pagan religion. And as I said, we're going to finish today with the twist in Manasseh's reign. But before we get to it and to our reading in 2 Chronicles chapter 33, I want to take a couple of minutes to consider the enduring consequences of his Rebellion. This is the first part of our sermon today, the enduring consequences of Manasseh's rebellion. And we're going to see in a moment that Manasseh's reign finished much better than it started. God was merciful to him and remarkably, he changed his ways. But that said... I think it's important for us to recognise that there were lasting consequences of his wickedness. Future generations paid a price for his decision to reject the Lord and to wholeheartedly pursue just about everything that the Lord had forbidden. And this reminds us that God will forgive the repentant sinner. He will wash away all sin and give to that person righteousness and everlasting life, but there still may be consequences to bear in this life and consequences borne by others. God will forgive the sin of adultery, but the consequences for your family and your reputation may be permanent. God will forgive the sin of anger, but the relationship you broke might never be repaired. God will forgive the sin of drunkenness, but you might have to live with the harm done to your body for the rest of your life. And the same is true for many sins. I want to briefly mention two of these consequences in Manasseh's case. The first was the wickedness of his son Ammon and the chaos of his reign. We see this in 2 Chronicles chapter 33 verses 21 to 25. You know, Ammon was two and twenty years old when he began to reign and reigned two years in Jerusalem. But he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as did Manasseh his father. For Ammon sacrificed unto all the carved images which Manasseh his father had made and served them. And humbled not himself before the Lord, as Manasseh his father had humbled himself, but Ammon trespassed more and more. And his servants conspired against him and slew him in his own house. But the people of the land slew all them that had conspired against King Ammon. And the people of the land made Josiah his son king in his stead. It would be naive to think that Manasseh's choices, his way of life, did not contribute to the murderous mess that was Ammon's reign. He did what his father had done. He worshipped the idols his father had made. And that did not lead to peace and harmony in his kingdom. Rather, it led to fractiousness and division. He didn't rule wisely or well. In fact, he was so bad, probably such a tyrant, that his own servants conspired against him and murdered him. And then there was a season of bloodletting. What an horrific episode in Judah's history. Now, of course, nothing is guaranteed 
when it comes to the next generation. Manasseh is a prime example. Uh, He had a righteous father, one of Judah's greatest kings, but turned out to be the worst of all. Now, there are no guarantees, but even so, it's not a suggestion. But even so, it's not a stretch to suggest that things might have been very different for Ammon and his reign if Manasseh had behaved differently. If he had been a righteous example, a righteous influence, if he had not made those idols that Ammon went on to worship. In this case, tragically, The apple did not fall very far from the tree. This was a terrible consequence of Manasseh's rebellion. But it gets worse. Not only was his son Ammon affected, the whole nation was. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, you will know about the Babylonian captivity, the the various deportations where captives were taken from Judah to Babylon. And then the siege and destruction of the city of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar in the year 586 BC. That traumatic experience in Judah's history was in part attributable to Manasseh and what he did. I won't go into detail about this today. I'm just going to read a handful of verses from two places. First of all, from 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 26 and 27. Uh, This was written after King Josiah's reforms to Judah's worship. Uh, Josiah was Manasseh's grandson, and he did some wonderful things. He he removed the idols out of Jerusalem. He restored the celebration of the Passover. And yet this is what we read. Notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah, because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him withal. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight, as I have removed Israel, and will cast off this city Jerusalem, which I have chosen, and the house of which I said, my name shall be there. Now, Josiah was a righteous king, but Manasseh, by his wickedness, had pushed the nation beyond the point of no return. God, in keeping with the covenant he had made, was going to judge his people allow their enemies to come and destroy the city of Jerusalem and take them away into captivity. The same thing is mentioned over in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 15 verse 4, speaking of Judah, the Lord said, And I will cause them to be removed into all kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for that which he did in Jerusalem. So despite the good news story that we're going to look at in our sermon today, we have to be aware that Manasseh's rebellion caused great suffering, and suffering beyond his immediate circle of family and friends. There were consequences that endured long past his life. And this serves as a sobering warning to us. This is yet further motivation not to walk away from the Lord. A life of selfishness and sin will do more damage than we can probably imagine. It may even impact upon future generations. Now with that said, we come to our text for today, the the final part of Manasseh's story. It's recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 33 verses 10 to 20, which I'm going to read now. 2 Chronicles chapter 33 verse 10. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him, And he was entreated of him, and heard his supplication, and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Now after this he built a wall without the city of David on the west side of Gihon in the valley, even to the entering in at the fish gate, encompassed about Ophel, and raised it up a very great height, and put captains of war in all the fenced cities of Judah. 
And he took away the strange gods and the idol out of the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem and cast them out of the city. And he repaired the altar of the Lord and sacrificed thereon peace offerings and thank offerings and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Nevertheless, the people did sacrifice still in the high places, yet unto the Lord their God only. For the rest of the acts of Manasseh, and his prayer unto his God, and the words of the seers that spake to him in the name of the Lord God of Israel, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel. His prayer also, and how God was entreated of him, and all his sin and his trespass, and the places wherein he built high places and set up groves and graven images before he was humbled, behold, they are written among the sayings of the seers. So Manasseh slept with his fathers, and they buried him in his own house, and Ammon his son reigned in his stead. And what we see in this passage are the immediate consequences of Manasseh's Rebellion, and this is the second part of our message today, the immediate consequences of Manasseh's rebellion. That God sent prophets to Manasseh and to the people. Uh, no doubt these prophets called out Manasseh's sin, urged him to repent, warned him of what would happen if he persisted. But that's exactly what he did. He willfully continued to do all of those things that we looked at last week, to engage in pagan religious practices that God had strictly forbidden his people from getting involved in. And Manasseh couldn't claim ignorance. Manasseh was without excuse. And eventually God's patience came to an end. The Assyrians were the dominant power in that part of the world at the time and by the providence of God, Assyrian soldiers marched right into Jerusalem and took Manasseh away. This was probably an attempt to turn Judah into a vassal state and, and, and a way of extorting money and treasure. If, uh, if Judah wanted its king back, it would have to pay a large ransom and probably ongoing tribute. Notice, if you would, the language in verse 11, it says, Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns, and bound him with fetters, and carried him to Babylon. The Hebrew expression translated among the thorns in our King James Version literally means with hooks. One scholar points out that Assyrian kings sometimes thrust a hook into the nostrils of their captives and so led them about. The practice is illustrated on many Assyrian reliefs in the British Museum. This is probably what the author of Chronicles is describing. This is what happened to Manasseh. He was made to suffer this painful humiliation. He was carried away to Babylon in fetters. A reference to change, chains made of brass. Uh, he didn't travel first class. He was treated like a slave. In verse 12, we're told that he was in affliction, which suggests that his accommodation in Babylon wasn't particularly comfortable. Was it a filthy prison cell? Was he kept in isolation? It certainly wasn't what he was used to in his palace in Jerusalem. In verse 12, we're told that this experience prompted Manasseh to humble himself and to cry out to the Lord his God, the God of his fathers. We shouldn't miss this. For years and years, Manasseh had been rebelling against the Lord his God, the God of his people, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And instead he had been calling out to the gods of other nations like Baal and Astarte and Moloch, false gods. Why didn't he call out to these gods when in prison in Babylon? There must have been something clarifying for Manasseh in this bitter experience. Or perhaps alone and in pain he remembered what the Lord had done for his father Hezekiah. How the Lord had miraculously delivered Judah from the Assyrians during his reign. Whatever the case, suddenly Manasseh was moved to humble himself and call out to the Lord. 
And that brings us to the next part of our sermon. Manasseh's response to God's unmerited kindness. The truly remarkable thing about this story is that the Lord heard Manasseh's prayer and delivered him from that prison cell in Babylon. Uh, Look at the first part of verse 13. It says, And prayed unto him, and he, the Lord, was entreated of him, and heard his supplication, and brought him again to Jerusalem, into his kingdom. Now the Lord would have been completely justified in leaving Manasseh to rot in that prison cell. That's what Manasseh deserved. As we've seen, he had gone out of his way to do all of the things that God had told his people not to do. The wages of sin is death. Manasseh had earned those wages more than any of his predecessors. And yet, God heard his prayer. By the gracious working of his providence, moved the Assyrians to release him and bring him back to his home and to his throne. Just to emphasise the point here, I I want to uh, look back up in the chapter to verse 9. It it says, So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. Manasseh was a vile man, a terrible king, and yet the Lord was merciful. And here we have another example in our Bible that speaks of the character of God, that he is gracious, that he is full of compassion, that that he delights in showing mercy, and his mercy extends even to the very worst of sinners, the most rebellious, the most debauched. The unmerited kindness that Manasseh received awakened him to the truth. It it says this at the end of verse 13. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Most of you know that capital L-O-R-D in the Old Testament is what is put when the divine name Yahweh occurs in the text. Uh, The verse literally reads, Then Manasseh knew that the Yahweh, he was God. Now, this was the central confession of faith for God's ancient people. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. It was a confession to the effect that Yahweh is God alone. This is what Manasseh finally understood. This is what he came to believe. He came to believe that all of those other gods he had worshipped were not gods. This statement at the end of verse 13 is a description of his conversion. He rejected the false gods and came to believe in the one true and living God and in him alone. This was his response to the grace of God. A repentance, a, a change of mind, a change of heart, a change of direction, and faith. Faith in the Lord God of his fathers. And this is the response that God's grace calls for today. His grace that has come to all people everywhere in the person and work of his Son, Jesus Christ. Like Manasseh. We deserve to be left to rot in the mess of our own making. We deserve to be abandoned by God, to be judged by God, to be be cast into hell forever, because we have all rebelled. We have all sinned against our Creator willfully and sometimes joyfully. But God, out of sheer love and kindness, did not abandon us. Rather, he sent his Son into the world to reconcile us, to redeem us, to heal what sin had broken in us. His Son came into the world. He took to himself true humanity. He was made in the likeness of men, born of a virgin in a filthy stable in Bethlehem. He grew up just like we do. He experienced many of the things that we experience, with one exception. 
He did not have a sinful heart, and so he did not commit sin. He was, in the words of the writer to the Hebrews, holy, harmless and undefiled. He lived a perfect life and then voluntarily gave himself for us. Yes, he was arrested, tried and crucified by wicked men, but only because he allowed them to do so. His life wasn't taken from him, not at all. Rather, he laid it down. He willingly offered his life to God as a sacrifice. He was the Lamb of God who had come to take away the sins of the world. And he bore our sins in his own body on the cross. And when you see a cross on the top of a a church building or on a necklace, that's what it represents. The death of Jesus, yes, but the death of Jesus for sinners in their place. It speaks of the love and grace of Almighty God. Jesus paid the penalty that was due to us for breaking God's law. He paid that penalty with his own blood so that God could be perfectly holy, just and righteous and at the same time forgive the guilty and declare them righteous. The Apostle Paul lays this all out in Romans chapter 3 verses 21 to 28. Now most of you have heard this message more times than you can remember. But don't let that stop you from appreciating once again just how remarkable it is that God would do such a thing, that he would reach out to us in this way. It's extraordinary that God's beloved Son, who dwelt in eternity, in perfect blessedness with the Father and with the Spirit, God's Son who needed nothing, would come into the world in the person of Jesus and so freely lay down his life for sinners, for rebels, for people who by nature don't want anything to do with him, who reject him. Now this grace, this unmerited kindness calls for a response. This is the gospel, and it calls men and women to repent. That is, like Manasseh, to have a change of mind and a change of heart to turn from themselves, to turn from their own efforts, to turn from false gods, to turn from their sin and believe in Jesus as the Lord, as God, and as their one and only Saviour, and thereby receive forgiveness and righteousness and everlasting life. Now I hope you have responded this way. I hope today you are trusting in Jesus and only in Jesus for your everlasting salvation. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father. No one comes to God except through him. Now when Manasseh received the unmerited kindness of God, he responded in this way. He believed that the Lord was God. But perhaps, just perhaps, there is a little part of us that is sceptical. That, that you know, puts a question mark next to his conversion. That's what I want to address in the fourth and final part of our message today. We've just considered his response to God's grace. Now we're going to see the authenticity of his repentance. Have you heard the expression, uh, there are no atheists in foxholes? It communicates the idea that when people are in grave danger, they call out to God for help, even if they've spent their whole life denying his existence. A similar idea is that of jailhouse religion, which one author defines this way, it is the sudden desperate piety of an inmate who's up against it, and hopes that God will somehow bail him out. I don't know about you, but I have a bit of a cynical streak. 
Uh, it's something I have to battle against. And so I'm tempted to look at Manasseh's conversion in this light. Of course he called out to the Lord. He was in a desperate situation. And of course he was going to express belief in the Lord after he got out of that situation. But you know, it wasn't genuine repentance. He, he wasn't really converted. If the account of his reign finished at verse 13, my guess would be that you know, after Manasseh made it home, he went straight back to his former manner of life, back to the pagan altars and the occult. But that's not what happened. What's recorded in the text tells us that his repentance was authentic. There was a genuine change of mind, a genuine change of heart. His works bore that out. Verses 15 and 16. And he took away the strange gods and the idol out of the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem and cast them out of the city. And he repaired the altar of the Lord and sacrificed thereon peace offerings and thank offerings and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. It wasn't a conversion of convenience. It wasn't foxhole repentance or jailhouse repentance. It was real repentance. And we know that because, in the words of John the Baptist, he brought forth fruit in keeping with repentance. There was an outward demonstration of that inward change. He got rid of the idols and the paraphernalia of pagan worship. He cast it out of the temple and out of the city. He restored true worship in the temple and used his authority to command his people to serve the Lord. And what a marvellous thing to read. What a marvellous thing to see. The grace of God at work in a sinner's life. And it's on this point that I want to land today. This example of real repentance. Now, the good works Manasseh performed when he arrived home safely were not his repentance. They were the fruit of his repentance. They were the outworking of his change of mind and change of heart. They demonstrated that he really had turned from idols to the one true and living God. If he'd come home and taken up where he left off, if he'd gone straight back to Baal and Astarte, back to the fortune tellers and the wizards, then we'd have good reason to doubt his repentance. There would be no evidence that he had changed his mind at all. I mentioned the words of John the Baptist a moment ago. Uh, let me give you the, the quote in full. It's from Luke chapter 3, beginning at verse 7. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance. Uh, the Greek word translated worthy here carries the idea of something that is fitting. In this context it means in keeping with or appropriate to. It, it doesn't mean to be worthy of, to earn or to merit something. Now bring forth therefore fruits in keeping with repentance and begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree therefore which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And the people asked him saying, what shall we do then? He answereth and saith unto them, he that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. Then came also publicans to be baptized, and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. Now, if John's hearers were serious about being right with the Lord in preparation for Messiah's arrival, if there was a genuine change of mind, a, a real turn to the Lord, then there would be a change 
in their behaviour. And that's what John urged them to do. He even gave specific examples. Examples of the fruit, of the kind of works that would be in keeping with repentance. He, he laid out what the people should do, and the tax collectors, and even the soldiers. The Apostle Paul ministered in the same fashion. This is how he explained his apostolic ministry to King Agrippa, Acts chapter 26, verses 19 and 20. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus, and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, and do works, meet, for repentance. Now there is a way of life that is in keeping with a person's turning to God, in, in keeping with their embrace of the good news. Paul taught that way of life. He impressed it upon those who professed faith in Christ. He taught them to do works meet or fitting to repentance. Now I know I'm speaking to an audience today mainly comprised of believers, of those who have turned to God and believed in his son Jesus. Uh, you, you are my brothers and sisters in Christ and because you are, you know that repentance is an essential part of following him. There is a daily, sometimes hourly, turning away from sin to God. Turning away from the desires of our flesh. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul refers to this as mortifying our members. You know, putting to death the sinful desires of our fallen human nature. And on those occasions when we do yield to temptation and fall into sin, we are called to repent, to turn from that sin and Confess it to the Lord. And Martin Luther well understood this facet of the Christian life. The first of his famous 95 theses was this. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Now again, if, if you've been walking with the Lord for a long time, you understand what I'm talking about. This is not news to you. But here's the point from our text today. Here's the lesson from the twist in Manasseh's story. How often is it the case that we're, we're wrestling with a particular sin? We, we know it's wrong. We're, we're filled with regret and remorse when we fall into it. We want to change. We want to say no when we're tempted. We want to overcome it. But we won't do anything outwardly. We hesitate to bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance. And this is often the reason why we don't change. Why we don't experience victory. We can be like Manasseh if he'd, turn, if he'd returned home with the best will in the world. But did nothing about the idols and the altars that were everywhere in Jerusalem. But allow me to press this a bit further. Now, I think most of the time we know exactly what would make a difference. We know what kind of fruit would be appropriate. Just like John offered his audience a range of practical suggestions, we know the kind of fruit that our repentance calls for. If I do this particular thing, if I get rid of that, if I admit my problem to another person, it would make a big difference. You know, if I was serious about my repentance, that's what I'd do. We usually know what we ought to do. But sometimes we don't do it. Because we're too proud. Too proud to admit that we've got a problem and ask for help. Or we're too attached to whatever it is that is contributing to our struggle. And we, when we won't do whatever it might be, when we won't bring forth fruit, we have to question the authenticity of our repentance. Just as we would the repentance of those who heard John preach and refused to do the things he told them to do. 
Now, I can't remember if I've shared this story from the pulpit before, but I heard a minister tell of a young man who came into his office seeking help to overcome a problem with internet pornography. It turned out that the young man was using his laptop to look at pornography, and he had brought it with him to the minister's office. And so the minister suggested that the two of them take the laptop, walk down to the river, and throw it in. As you might imagine, the young man recoiled at the idea, made excuses why he, he couldn't do that, but the minister made his point, didn't he? It was the same point Jesus was making in Mark chapter 9 when he said, If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. Jesus was talking about repentance. He was using hyperbole, you know, graphic language, to press home the need to take action against the things that draw us into sin, to, to actually do something. And this is the message from God's word for us today. Like Manasseh was, let us be serious about this matter of repentance. If we are repentant inwardly, then we ought to do something outwardly. We need to bring forth fruit. If we don't, or if we won't, then how serious are we? How much do we really care about our sin? How interested are we really in pleasing the Lord and growing in likeness to his Son, Jesus Christ? If you know there is something you need to do, something your repentance calls for, then do it. Even if it's hard, even if it's humiliating, and the Lord will give you grace, the Lord will help you to walk in the victory that he has already won. Amen.